Hello, my name is John Landy. I'm a retired law professor at the University of Missouri Law School. And this presentation provides a discussion of a wide range of issues about the resolution of legal disputes. And in general, it's going to talk about an overview of what I think is most important about what's called ADR in legal disputes. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, or some of it is different from traditional ADR theory. You can see that I put uh, in the A in parentheses because uh, a lot of people, including me, think that it really should be called dispute resolution for a variety of reasons. Alternative makes it sound as if it is secondary to litigation and trial, um, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. And uh, also these procedures such as mediation, arbitration, and a variety of other things that aren't in litigation actually occur much more frequently than in trial and trial and litigation. Uh, only occur in a relatively small proportion of cases. So I generally use the term dispute resolution as many people in the field do. I want to just mention that there are many variations in the United States and around the world. And so I'm going to be providing some general ideas and perspectives, but you need to be paying attention to local rules and norms and practices because there are these variations. So I'm going to talk about what people can do with ADR. I want to start off by highlighting that litigation is very important. It provides many, many important functions for society and for parties, uh, particularly if they cannot reach agreement with others in dispute. It provides an opportunity to resolve them in a, an official, legitimate, neutral way. Um, on the other hand, it also creates a lot of problems for parties and practitioners, which is part of the impetus for developing these alternatives. And the, this field, the dispute resolution field, offers many options for improvements and increased choices. Having said that, dealing with disputes is extremely difficult in any context. And so dispute resolution techniques are imperfect and you should recognize them. They're not necessarily gonna always work and they're not gonna work well all the time. So you and practitioners should be paying attention to problems with dispute resolution techniques of any sort and work to prevent and counteract them. So what is this thing that's alternative dispute resolution or just dispute resolution? Well, I'm gonna start by talking about what it's not or what it's not necessarily. It's not necessarily work by neutrals. A lot of people think of ADR as particularly mediation and arbitration where you have neutral private parties who help to resolve disputes. But a major part of the field is negotiation where you don't have a neutral party involved. You have just two parties or two sides or multiple sides without any neutral involved to uh, resolve the, the process or help resolve the process. It's also not necessarily interest-based, although some uh, processes, negotiation and mediation do focus on parties' interests, many of them do not. It doesn't necessarily involve party self-determination. Again, mediation, negotiation are rely on the parties making decisions for themselves. But in arbitration, for example, the parties, after they agree to arbitration, uh, at that point, it's in the hands of the ar arbitrator who is an adjudicator and the parties don't have the power of self-determination the way they do in negotiation or mediation. It's not necessarily a good process. Uh, certainly sometimes these ADR processes do provide some real benefits, but sometimes there are problems with it. Um, it's not necessarily private. Um, there are public mandates and use of neutrals who are public officials. So for example, uh, Courts sometimes order parties to attend mediation, and sometimes uh, the process is involved a settlement conference by uh, by judges who are are uh, public officials. And although ADR involves a lot of innovation, it's not necessarily innovative. A lot of times, unfortunately, it becomes very routinized, and people don't focus on how to continually improve it. So, what is it? 
in my view, dispute resolution is generally the process of planning, managing, and or resolving disputes, a very broad general definition. And in this definition, I include lawyers, judges, and court administrators, and I consider them all dispute resolution professionals. Uh, many people in the field don't think of them in that way, but I do. And I think it's helpful to think of them because they do plan, manage, and help resolve disputes. Uh, so I, I encourage you to think broadly about what this field is about. Let me shift gears to talk about how lawyers interact with their clients and their counterpart lawyers. Unfortunately, clients often are very frustrated with their lawyers. Um, a lot of times lawyers assume that clients just want a favorable outcome. And although certainly clients generally do want a favorable outcome, they often want other things. They may want extra legal goals, which might include admissions of fault by the other side, answers, apologies, or acknowledgments of harm, prevention of recurrences, and retribution for defendant contact, uh, conduct. And I take this particularly from uh, one research project of plaintiffs uh, in medical malpractice case looking at what they wanted. But many defendants also have many extra legal goals, not just getting the most favorable outcome. And many clients want a satisfactory process with lawyers, and they're often frustrated with their lawyers because the lawyers don't communicate well, they don't display empathy and understanding of the clients, and they don't display respect that clients really crave. A lot of times, unfortunately, lawyers make assumptions, again, that clients just want a favorable outcome, they aren't particularly engaged in the process, don't particularly care to hear what the, is going on, and the lawyers just see this as another process that uh, clients just need to go ahead and, and leave to the lawyers. Uh, some clients want that, but many don't, and many, lawyer, many clients are extremely frustrated with their lawyers. And supporting this was a, a recent study that showed that new lawyers are woefully unprepared to work with clients and found that the new lawyers, lawyers who had just been in practice for several years, um, failed to, were unprepared to gain clients' trust, gather relevant facts and identify clients' goals, to communicate regularly with clients, convey information and options so that the clients can understand and help clients choose a strategy for dealing with their dispute, and to manage client expectations break bad news and cope with difficult clients. Many people uh, think of what lawyers do as legal research and writing and arguing in court. And all those things are important and many lawyers do those things. But it's helpful to consider that all of those things are in the service of working for their clients. And in order to really help your clients the best lawyers need to do the sorts of things that are listed here. And unfortunately, many lawyers, not just new lawyers, but many lawyers of every stage in their practice don't do these things well or as well as they should. Another problem is the relationships between counterpart lawyers. Now, a lot of times people use the term opposing counsel to refer to the lawyer on the other side of the case but I think that term is misleading because counterpart lawyers often cooperate. Uh, they do it sometimes because they're ordered to by the court and often because they think it's good practice and that's just the way they are. They don't wanna fight over anything that they don't need to. And the relationships between counterpart lawyers can make a huge difference in the way people act, both the parties and the lawyers themselves. Uh, cases can be very cooperative or they can be your own private hell if you're a lawyer. If the lawyers uh, are reasonable with each other, uh, they will make things go smoothly, make it more efficient, make it go quickly, uh, and not raise unnecessary issues to dispute. On the other hand, some lawyers will do just the opposite. They will be extremely difficult, they'll be obnoxious, they will uh, fight over every little thing, whether that makes sense or not. And, um, and, and, but it's not something that you are doomed to. So 
just because you are in a relationship with another lawyer doesn't mean that you can't affect the relationship with that lawyer. And there are things that you can do that will benefit yourself as a lawyer and your clients. First thing is to get to know each other personally. If you don't know the lawyer on the other side of a case, I suggest that at the beginning of the case, you get on the phone and have a conversation with them. Ideally have lunch or a coffee and just get to know each other. Find out where they grew up, where they went to law school, where their family, tell them, tell them of each other about your families, what your hobbies are, if you like to travel. If you develop these kind of personal relationships, it's a lot harder to act badly to each other. So getting to know each other personally is very helpful if you can. And then to initiate mutually helpful actions and, and not be difficult if it's not in your client's interest to, to be uh, disputing something that the other side is, is looking for. Share information if you can, uh, again, with your client's permission and if it's in your client's interest to do so, particularly, for example, things that they're going to be getting anyway through discovery. And to be respectful in front of the clients. One of the things that lawyers really hate is when they're embarrassed by having to fight in front of the other side and have uh, the other side make them look bad in front of their clients. So if you can be respectful, you don't necessarily want to be act as if you were best friends, but you can be professional and respectful and that that can help promote good relationships between counterpart lawyers and help you have better process for resolving disputes, which can help your clients. And what is the first thing that you are likely to do is you're going to be negotiating. And what is negotiating? Well, there are lots of definitions and there's no consensus. My definition is that it's a process of seeking agreement about a course of action. Very general, simple, basic definition. Some definitions require some of the following things, which you'll see isn't included in my definition. So some assume that there's a dispute, but of course there's some negotiations that are about transactions, negotiating deals. Some definitions assume that there's an exchange of offers, but this isn't necessarily true. And that isn't the, the way that some uh, negotiations occur and, and agreements result. Some assume that there needs to be legal consideration or quid pro quo that would produce a legal contract, which may or may not be the goal of the negotiation. You can use these elements to describe particular negotiation without using them as definitional elements. So you can say, well, this is a dispute negotiation, or this is a negotiation where there was an exchange of offers without assuming that every negotiation has all of these features. Now, one of the things is that lawyers negotiate all the time. People often think of negotiation only as a process with a counterpart lawyer at the final stage of a case. But in fact, lawyers negotiate throughout cases with a lot of different people. So lawyers seek agreement with their clients. The first negotiation is with your clients about fee arrangements and the scope of the work that you're gonna be doing. This isn't necessarily something that you take for granted and um, you need to have a conversation with your clients and this will set the, the framework of your relationship. Lawyers negotiate with the counterpart lawyers about a whole range of things, such as extension of deadlines, which is done very routinely. In the discovery process, there's often a lot of negotiation about what will or will not be included in negotiation or if they're in discovery or to resolve disputes about discovery. Um, lawyers will often negotiate with supervisors or the lawyers that they're supervisor, supervising about what arguments to include in a brief. Uh, you may be negotiating with your coworkers about what to order for lunch. You may be negotiating with experts about the content of opinion letters, what to include or not. No, negotiating with court reporters about scheduling, negotiating with mediators about what materials to provide before everyone convenes in mediation, and you may even negotiate with judges about a discovery schedule about a variety of things. So negotiation is a lot broader than just resolving a dispute at the end of a case. Now, one of the things that people 
often talk about are BATNA, it's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And the standard advice is to calculate the BATNA, which is an important thing to do. It's important, necessary, but not sufficient. Now in lawsuits, the BATNA is the expected court outcome. So if you are a plaintiff and you think that if you go to court and you win, you'll get a hundred thousand dollars, that's your BATNA, that's your expected court outcome. In transactional negotiations, the BATNA would be what some other alternative would be to a particular deal. It may be a better deal with some other negotiating partner or your BATNA may be just the status quo. Now, the general principle is that parties should not accept a settlement worse than the BATNA. So if you think that you would get $100,000, you're a plaintiff, you're representing a plaintiff and you get $100,000 if you went to court, why should you accept an offer from the defendant of only $90,000? And that general principle makes sense, but it doesn't reflect the costs of continuing to litigate. And there are tangible costs of legal fees and expenses and intangible costs such as stress and harm to relationships, which I'll be talking about more shortly. So the bottom line combines the BATNA and the costs. So for example, you know, again, if you're representing the plaintiff, you think you would get $100,000 if you went to trial, but it would cost you $20,000 in legal fees to continue to litigate and go to trial. It would make sense for you to accept any offer above $80,000. So if the defendant offers you $90,000, that's less than the $100,000 of the court judgment, but it's more than the net result, which would be 100 minus 20 or 80,000. So 90 is better than 80 from the plaintiff's perspective. So you really should be focusing on the bottom line, not the BATNA. The BATNA is important. It's a part of the bottom line, but it's not the main thing. It's not the whole thing. So you really should be focusing on the the bottom line, which combines the bad and the costs, the tangible and intangible costs. Now, thinking about what the bad is, the expected court outcome, people often make biased assessments of court outcomes for very for a lot of reasons. One is that court outcomes are extremely hard to predict. There are so many uncertainties. You just don't know what the witnesses are going to be like what their demeanor is going to be like. They may be different than if you have conducted a deposition with them. Uh, you don't know the attitudes of the judge or the jury. You don't know how judges are going to rule about particular issues. There are lots of different issues that will interact. So it's just very hard to predict what the court outcomes are going to be. And then there are cognitive and motivational biases. People have cognitive processes that tend to make them generally be overconfident and, and have uh, views that reflect their self-interest and see themselves more positively and see their counterparts more negatively. There are a lot of these biases. And then the lawyer-client relationships lead to what we call a conspiracy of optimism, where both the lawyers and the clients want to put their best foot forward put, and, and, and assume that the outcome is gonna be particularly favorable. Clients may want to present themselves to lawyers uh, as having cases that are worth uh, taking on and that uh, the clients don't present themselves as being foolish. And the lawyers want to gain the client's respect and to hire them. And so there's a bias for both of them to have uh, this conspiracy of optimism of being uh, expecting to have more favorable results than objectively one might expect. And then the adversary system creates an incentive for bias. Each side needs to start with biased uh, assessments and positions regarding the other because the other will take advantage if you are more candid. And so each side, the plaintiffs tend to uh, have a there's an incentive to exaggerate the amount of the court outcome that they're, they're claiming. And conversely, defendants have a, a interest in understating the expected court outcome. So all of these things combine to create overly optimistic assessments of the court outcome in many cases. 
Now this combines with what's called positional negotiation and the ritual that is involved, which is problematic. Unfortunately, it's very common. And in this process, both sides start with extreme positions and then make counter offers, hoping to maximize their outcome. So plaintiff may start by asking for $500,000, um, even if they expect that the outcome and they think that the reasonable result of the outcome of the, the case should be $100,000. They'll start with an extreme position because they're afraid that if they said $100,000, they would get a lot less. By the same token, defendants will start with a, a very low number. They may start with $1,000 or $10,000. And then there'll be exchange of offers and counter offers. So the plaintiff may reduce a initial demand of 500,000 to 400,000. And then the defendant may counter with raising from 10 to 20,000 and then 300,000 and 20 to 30,000. So there's an exchange of offers and counter offers and each side is trying to end up with the most favorable outcome. Now, supposedly these positions that parties are taking are based on the expected court outcome but that's obviously not true. Uh, if you gave the lawyers truth serum, they would tell you that, that this is just the way this process works and they have to do it or else their clients would be harmed. But they make these arguments as if this is what they really believed. And unfortunately, this process is uncomfortable for everyone, especially for parties, because it's so unprincipled. So just imagine you're a plaintiff and your lawyer tells you, well, the case may really be worth $100,000, but we're going to start with $500,000 because otherwise you won't get your $100,000 or hopefully even more than $100,000. And then you go through this positional negotiation process and you reduce the initial demand of $500,000 to $400,000 and $300,000 and $200,000. And each time the client feels that he or she has lost, even though they never had the 500 or $400,000, but it feels that way. And even the lawyers who know how this process works sometimes feel hurt, insulted, and angry if they think that the other side isn't acting honorably, isn't negotiating in faith, is making extreme unreasonable positions, even though they know this process is based on that. And, and it's hard on mediators who help parties who are playing along with this game, even though everybody knows that it's, it's a game. And you can see I put it in quotation marks because it's not really a game, especially not for the parties, but the mediators have to cajole and coax and try and get particularly the lawyers to come down gradually in a way that is gonna save everyone's face. It's, it's a, a very common process, but it's less than ideal. Uh, another, a common process is what I've called ordinary legal negotiation. And unfortunately, it's almost completely missing from dispute resolution theory. In many cases, lawyers reasonably, realistically focus on expected court outcomes or typical agreements. There's some haggling and discussion of parties' interests, but basically they will start with the expected court outcomes. So for example, in a divorce case involving minor children. There are statutes that provide for what the presumed amount of child support would be. And if you were gonna go into court, you would likely get, the court would presumably order that amount of child support as specified in the statute. Now, sometimes there's still some negotiating back and forth. The party paying the support may argue why there are circumstances that should reduce the amount and the party receiving it may argue that there are circumstances why the amount should be increased. And they may talk about justify based on the party's interests, um, but it's not the extreme positional negotiation where they start with wildly unrealistic numbers. If they did that, then the negotiation would end. Uh, sometimes the negotiations are based on typical agreements. So again, in divorce cases, there are typical parenting schedules, the schedules when children will be with one parent or the other. And often those typical agreements are the, the starting point for negotiation. And the negotiation talks about deviations, uh, relatively minor deviations, usually from those typical agreements. 
And this process of ordinary legal negotiation is common in cases where there are relatively small stakes, where this process is the norm, and where lawyers value their reputations for reasonableness. So for example, it's common, certainly not universal, but common in family law cases, in some workers' comp cases, compensation cases, is very common and actually the norm in criminal plea bargaining um, and lots of other uh, situations uh, where um, there is just this ex expectation that you're not going to be playing this positional negotiation game. And um, if you start off in the positional negotiation game, um, you may be able to change the game um, to ordinary uh, legal negotiation by discussing the process with the counterpart lawyer. You can say, well, if you want, we can go through this haggling, this extreme positional negotiation where we each start with extreme positions and it takes a long time and we may never get there and it costs a lot of money, or we can basically be a lot more efficient and start by focusing more realistically. Um, this doesn't always work, may not work in a particular case, but it may be worth trying in some cases. Now, a third theoretical approach to negotiations called interest-based negotiation, or lots of these things have different terms. Um, it's popularized by the book Getting to Yes, and involves identifying both parties' interests, identifying options, a range of options for satisfying parties' interests, identifying criteria for making decisions to select the options, and it might be based on the party's values, uh, objective standards, or the law, among other things, uh, going rates uh, uh, in, in transactions, and then picking options that satisfy both parties' interests. And when this process works, it is terrific. It has the potential to create value. Both sides can be better off um, then in a positional negotiation where the assumption is a zero sum, where one party's gain is necessarily the other party's loss. Interest-based negotiation has the potential for making both parties better off, which is what is described as creating value. Unfortunately, it also has the potential for exploitation. If the parties are candid about what their interests are, the other side can take advantage of it and be more demanding in terms of satisfying the other side's interests. So one needs to be careful about using this interest-based negotiation. And unfortunately, it's not used in litigation in the United States as much as one might hope because it has these potential benefits. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears now to talk to about mediation. Now mediation, is a process where a third party neutral helps parties to, in a dispute, to try and reach an agreement. The mediator, mediator doesn't have the power to impose a decision if the parties don't agree. The mediator is just there to try and help parties reach an agreement. And the theory of facilitative and evaluative mediation is based on supposedly alternative models. And these are, there are lots of different models of theories of how mediators should or do work and facilitative and evaluative mediation is probably the most common one. Uh, and the theory is based on uh, these supposedly alternative models. So facilitative mediation consists of helping parties develop and exchange proposals, asking about strengths and weaknesses of a case, asking about consequences of settling and trial, helping parties understand their interests, helping parties develop options. So you can see that these are really, it's generally oriented to helping parties make decisions for themselves. Evaluative mediation in theory consists of the mediator assessing the strengths and weaknesses of a case, predicting the impact of settling and of court outcomes, urging parties to settle and proposing settlements. So this is oriented to uh, trying to reach agreement, to reach settlements. Now, you can just look at both of these things and you notice that in facilitator mediation, they're helping the parties make decisions, but the implicit or explicit goal is to help them reach agreement. In evaluative mediation, the goal is to reach agreement 
And this process often is designed to help parties make decisions so that they will reach agreement. The other thing that you should notice is that each of these things involves several different elements, which indeed are different. And mediators don't do all of them. They don't do all of them at the same time. So they're um, what I call bundled models. They're bundling lots of different behaviors. Now, the research and experience challenges these models. Most of the mo these models are oversimplified and misleading. They bundle together different interventions. Uh, some people argue that facilitative uh, mediation um, doesn't interfere with um, party decision making, but evaluative mediation does harm parties. But the, these interventions don't necessarily produce the theorized effects. So part of the, the essence of facilitative mediation is that the mediator generally asks questions and doesn't make declarative statements. But the problem is that when you just, by virtue of asking a question, there's often a statement behind the question. So if you ask, why do you think that you're going to win if you went to court, may have an implication that the mediator thinks that they're not going to win or that they have an unrealistic expectation. Uh, there's this concept of reality testing questions and the reality testing question has this unstated implicit assumption that the party's expectations are unrealistic. So um, that can affect the party's decision-making even though supposedly it doesn't. And by the same token, evaluative mediation doesn't necessarily harm parties. A lot of times parties want to hear the mediator's perspectives and the mediators can provide them in a way that doesn't coerce parties to reach agreement or reach particular agreement or change their positions. Courts in the last several decades in the United States have been ordering parties to mediation. And the theory is that if parties and especially lawyers are exposed to mediation, they will like it and settle. And in fact, they have. And it's particularly helpful for lawyers who are afraid to suggest mediation for fear of appearing weak. Unfortunately, there's a very strong current in legal culture that if someone suggests negotiation or mediation, the other side may make an assumption that the person thinks that their case is weak and that therefore um, they're suggesting negotiation or mediation to avoid going to trial and losing. Um, there are lots of other reasons why people may want to negotiate even if they think they have a strong case, but this is a very common assumption. And so having courts order parties for mediation helps lawyers so that they can say, well, gosh, I'm not suggesting mediation. It's the lawyer, the lawyer, the, the, the court, the court is making me go to mediation. And in fact, court-ordered mediation has often produced good res uh, a process and results. Unfortunately, without it, a lot of times the lawyers will not be negotiating at all with the, the other side and mediation forces them to consider uh, what settlements might be in their client's best interest and often produce good results. And so court-ordered mediation has produced a lot of very good outcomes for, for lawyers and for parties. And indeed, courts, lawyers, and mediators have become dependent on court-ordered mediation. Courts often are overwhelmed, uh, and so they're looking to resolve cases and have parties go to mediation to um, take cases off their docket. Lawyers often want to get cases resolved because there's all this risk and uncertainty of going to trial and by settling in mediation, they can avoid that risk. And mediators have become dependent on getting a steady stream of cases where the courts have ordered parties to mediate. So um, there's a, a, a lot of interest in having court-ordered mediation. Unfortunately, court-ordered mediation also creates the risk of coercion. It doesn't happen in most cases, but unfortunately there are enough cases where it does happen, sometimes very explicitly, a lot of times just implicitly, there's this expectation on parties that they're going to settle. And often the expectation comes from their own lawyers. So 
court order mediation has a lot of benefits, but it also has some risks that people should be aware of. More generally, there's a process in the dispute resolution field called dispute system design. And this is where stakeholder groups collaborate to design a process achieving specified goals for a system, such as courts. Now, dispute system design is used in lots of different contexts, lots of different organizations, businesses, government agencies, um, lots of different entities. I'm just gonna be focusing on courts. And uh, the theory of change article, which is, I'll provide a link at the end of this PowerPoint, lists 38 possible goals in the dispute resolution field that people have had uh, for dispute resolution processes and 26 strategies. So what you can see is that there are a lot of possible goals and you can't do them all. And they're all not the same priority. And even once you pick a, a goal, there are a lot of different possible ways of achieving them. And so what dispute system design is intended to do is to bring together different stakeholder groups, groups with different perspectives about the, the, the disputes and the dispute process to help essentially negotiate a general process for handling them. And in my view, courts should design mediation programs so that parties and lawyers want to mediate. And that's really what the goal would be. And that would reduce the risk of coercion that I just mentioned. Courts have multiple tools in their toolboxes. A lot of times courts and lawyers and judges only think about rules and coercion. They'll say, okay, you're gonna to have to go to mediation and I'm gonna make a, a rule that says you have to do it. The court has a rule. And if you don't do it, then you are subject to being punished by uh, having sanctions. Well, that's one tool that courts have, but there are lots of other tools. So some of the other tools are sponsoring continuing education programs, encouraging practitioners to participate in peer consultation groups, developing educational materials for lawyers and for parties, recommending mediation without ordering it, and generally shaping good legal and mediation practice culture. So there are lots of things that lawyers and judges can do and courts can do, um, and they're not mutually exclusive. You may be, there are lots of different strategies once you decide what the goals and priorities are. Now, one particular goal that I think is particularly important is early dispute resolution. And it has many particular benefits. And uh, one is that it helps parties make good decisions. If you think about resolution of cases late in the process, parties' decisions have already, many of the decisions already are foreclosed. Things have already happened, it's too late to resolve things. Whereas if you can have an early dispute resolution process, parties can think about things early on when they have a lot more options. They can, and given that they have a lot more options, they can tailor the dispute resolution processes to satisfy their interests, which can improve outcomes. It can reduce the tangible and intangible costs for the parties in the courts. It can reduce the sunk cost bias, which is one of those cognitive and motivational biases that happens. And what this refers to is once people are far down the road in litigation, they may feel that they've invested so much time and money in it that they have to keep going in order to justify all the time and money that they've invested. And this is a completely understandable emotional reaction. It just is a very poor way to make decisions. There's nothing that you can do in the future that's gonna get back the time and money that you spent in the past. So if you have an early dispute resolution process, you have less of this sunk cost to be able to, that people feel that they need to justify and continue um, to refuse to reach reasonable agreements. And if you're having a, an early dispute resolution process, it can reduce the adversarial dynamics one of the things that happens when disputes continue for a long time, you the, the conflict escalates and each action may justify um, angry reactions by the other side and angry feelings. And it just perpetuates this adversarial process. Whereas if you can 
nip it in the bud and start early on with early dispute resolution, you may be able to reduce or avoid those dynamics. So in terms of a dispute system design process, one of the goals might be to try and resolve disputes early so that you can gain these possible benefits. Now I'm gonna switch gears to talk about some specific things that practitioners can do, um, particularly this litigation interest and risk assessment process uh, that is designed primarily for lawyers, but also for mediators. And the goal here is to improve party decision-making. And it reflects a fundamental ethical obligation, both of lawyers and mediators. Now for mediators, this is pretty obvious. The goal for mediators is to help parties make decisions. The mediators themselves can't make decisions. The only way that there's a resolution of a mediation uh, is if the parties make a decision. But even for lawyers, the lawyers have ethical obligations to help parties make decisions. The ultimate decision about whether to settle or to go to trial is a decision that is reserved solely for the parties. But beyond that, there are lots of other decisions that the parties may be making and the ethical rules require lawyers to provide relevant information and candid advice to clients so that they can make good decisions. So this Lyra process is desired, designed to help lawyers and mediators fulfill their professional ethical obligations to help clients make decisions. Now, it also is designed to improve results for parties, courts, and societies by reducing decision errors and going to trial after rejecting good settlement offered. Now, you can see I put decision errors in quotation marks. This refers to several studies which found that a large proportion, in a large proportion of cases that go to trial, one side or the other gets a worse result at trial than the last side's, the other side's settlement offer. So imagine this, suppose you are a plaintiff and, or you're representing a plaintiff and the defendant offers you $100,000. And then you go to trial and you get a trial decision of only $50,000. Well, this is a horrible, horrible result for your client. Your client is getting $50,000 less than the $100,000 settlement offer and they've invested all this time and money of continuing to litigate and going to trial that they could have saved if they had accepted the settlement offer. Now, it's also really bad because the client is likely to be mad at the lawyer for saying, well, how come we didn't settle and why do we go to trial and how come you didn't get a better decision at trial? So it's, it's a bad result if you go to trial and get a, a worse result than the other side's settlement offer. Now, it isn't necessarily a, an error to go to trial. Imagine this, suppose that you knew for sure that in going to trial, you had a 90% chance of winning. Pretty good. So you go to trial and you lose. Well, maybe you just had bad luck. It was one of those 10% of the cases where you were going to lose. Well, is that a, an error to make a decision to go to trial, particularly if your client has made the decision to go to trial? No, it's not an error. You just got a bad result. Now, the problem is if you look at it in aggregate, the, the research shows that a large proportion of cases, one side or the other does get this worse result. So something like more than 60% of plaintiffs and more than 20% of defendants who go to trial and get worse results than the, the other side's last offer. So if you look at it in aggregate, that is just horrible. 80% of cases, give or take, depending on the situation, uh, the courts and all that, um, may get worse results than going to trial. So if you have a good litigation interest and risk assessment process, you can reduce the risk that there will be these kinds of decision errors. And I'm gonna be talking a lot more about how you can do that. And part of that is by reducing the tangible and, and intangible costs of litigation, uh, which are major elements of the bottom line that we talked about. So the benefits of the process are that you can systematically um, address these elements that lawyers and mediators often don't do. And they 
lawyers and mediators often don't uh, focus on intangible costs, which often are overlooked or undervalued. And the lateral process provides a logical sequence to enhance party decision making. And practitioner has different philosophies and they need to tailor the cases to particular their processes to particular parties. And the process is very flexible as I'll describe. And it's one, as I mentioned, that lawyers often use, but mediators can use it as well. And the mediators can do it to help the, the parties do their own litigation interest and risk assessment to help identify key legal and factual uncertainties and possible outcomes to estimate the BATNAs and develop bottom lines. So the mediators don't necessarily make the assessments, but they help the clients, the parties, make these assessments by identifying uncertainties. And mediators can help the clients by explicitly considering the costs, the tangible and intangible costs, and to help clients, parties develop wise and effective mediation strategies. So let me talk about the elements of Lyra, the three elements. First is the expected court outcome, the BATNA that we talked about, the tangible costs of continuing to litigate, the intangible costs of continuing to litigate. Note that it can be used before the filing of lawsuits. It generally focuses on monetary disputes, but can, be, can include non-monetary issues. And it focuses on future costs, not the past sunk costs, which has the problems that we just discussed. So the first element is the court outcome. As we mentioned, litigation can provide substantial benefits to parties in society, but it's inherently risky and parties may get unfavorable court decisions. Parties' expectations about the court outcome are often major factors in negotiation and mediation, as we talked about. So part of it is to help them make good assessments of the court outcome, which we described are hard to make and often are biased. The second are tangible costs, which include legal fees for represented parties and a whole range of possible legal expenses for discovery, for experts, and for all sorts of other things. And then the intangible costs, which I've referred to. Being a party in litigation imposes many intangible costs, such as stress, which can cause, literally, it can cause physical and psychological harm just by being in litigation and continuing to be in litigation over a period of time. Tremendous amount of stress causing significant harm. Parties often feel stuck in disputes and they can't get on with their life or business because they're just so focused on the litigation. It damages relationships, it harms reputations, and it prevents them from doing all sorts of other things with their lives. So they, if they don't have the time and money to do things because it's all sucked up in uh, litigation, then they can't go on vacations. They can't invest in their kids' college. Uh, and by the same token, businesses just can't uh, in, in, uh, engage in additional uh, new innovative uh, efforts uh, or new opportunities for, for business and, and profit making activities. So just being in litigation can cause tremendous intangible costs. And they're important to parties, often more important than the court outcome itself. And you can help parties identify and value the intangible costs by asking how much it would be worth to them to avoid the delay, risk, stress, and so on of going to trial. So for example, you could say to a plaintiff, okay, suppose that we could get a settlement now for $100,000. But if you go to trial, you know, it would take another six months to a year. Um, how much is it worth to you to avoid the delay of six to 12 months and get a result now? And they may say, well, if we could get $100,000 if we went to trial, I'd be willing to take $90,000 or $80,000 now and avoid having the delay or having the risk of the uncertainty of what would happen if I went to trial or the stress of the uncertainty of what's going to happen if you go to trial. So you can help the clients identify what is important to them and help them assign a value to what those intangible interests are. And they're going to be different for different parties. So 
some parties have a great tolerance for risk and others have very little tolerance for risk. And so they would value it differently. Part of what lawyers and mediators can do is help the clients identify what their intangible interests are and attach a value to it. And one of the virtues of considering the, these intangible costs is it can reduce expectations for the monetary outcome, making it easier to settle. So for example, if, you, if your plaintiff, your client who's a plaintiff says, okay, I'm willing to, I think I could get $100,000 if we went to trial, but I'm willing, but the process, the stress, the risk, the delay of waiting six to 12 months is worth $20,000 to me. I'm willing to take $80,000 now so I can avoid the delay, the risk, the stress or whatever of going to trial, then that makes it easier to settle. And the defendant may do the same thing. They may say, gosh, the delay, the risk, the stress is worth, I'm willing to pay extra to avoid those things. So by considering the value of these intangible costs, you increase the potential for reaching a satisfactory resolution or satisfactory settlement. So you can develop bottom lines by adjusting the estimated BATNA value by the amount of the tangible and intangible costs. And bottom lines are the tripwires to end negotiation or mediation if the parties can't reach an acceptable agreement. So if the plaintiff says, okay, my bottom line is $80,000, they know that anything that the defendant offers that is less than $80,000, then they're not going to accept it. Now, one of the things is that these bottom lines change over time and can change, but at any given moment, that's the value of the bottom line. It's one of the bottom, the values is to help them decide whether they want to end negotiation or to continue in litigation and possibly go to trial. Another value of the bottom line is that it's an element in a strategy um, particularly if they're using this positional negotiation process. So if the plaintiff has a bottom line of $100,000, they may say, okay, well, starting, if, if that's my end point, I want to get at least $100,000, then here's what my first offer needs to be. And then I'm going to think about what each additional concession might be so that I will end up getting more than my bottom line of $100,000. So the bottom line is a really important factor. It includes the BATNA, but it's more than the BATNA. It includes the, the costs, the tangible and intangible costs, which are so important to parties. Now for me mediators, um, mediators can use their, their skills of asking good questions and listening carefully to figure out what the dispute is really about, um, often by talking with the parties and lawyers in caucus separate meetings with one side or the other. And mediators should not assume that the dispute is about the correct interpretation of the facts or the law. It may be, but it can be about a lot of other sources of conflict. So what are some other sources of conflict? Personality conflicts. The parties may just hate each other's guts. Maybe it's an underlying conflict. It's something that's been going on for a long time and it's just flared up into a dispute something happened that was the last straw and they just weren't going to continue with the conflict um, without uh, a dispute. It may make it, people may feel that they can't afford to just overlook things. They need to engage in disputes. There may be conflict against they're not as, as competent as they might be. Conflict because parties are afraid to appear weak and so they're they're going to take, stimulate the other side to take tough positions. Parties don't know each other or trust each other. They don't know the case yet. There's poor communion of the lawyers with their, their clients or with the counterpart lawyers. The concern about setting precedent, they're reluctant to reach agreement. Sometimes lawyers want to fight. They want to perform for their clients. They want to increase their fees and that's the source of conflict. Oh, and sometimes their unrealistic trial outcome would be. So you can look at this whole long list and see that the expectations about the trial outcome are just one of many possible sources of conflict. And it's important for lawyers and mediators to help the clients figure out what the heck this conflict really is about. 
So lawyers and mediators are essentially conflict diagnosticians. And you can do this by asking questions like, what's most important to you in this case? Why haven't the parties settled so far? And these questions can really open up the client and uh, the lawyer or the mediator to figure out what's really going on and why the, the parties have conflict and a dispute that they haven't settled. And as we've discussed, the parties generally want favorable financial results, but they vary in what they define as favorable or acceptable. And so this is an important thing for, for lawyers and mediators to learn and help the clients figure out. And as we've said, clients may want other things which may be as or more important than the financial outcome. Things like being treated with respect, having good relationships, getting a favorable precedent, getting apologies, future employment, recommendation, lots of other things. So part of what lawyers and mediators should be doing is helping the clients sit what the dispute is about and what they really want. A key part of this is understanding the other side's perspective. And you can ask the client what they think the other side's perspectives and goals are. You can ask them if they think that any of the perspectives and goals are justified and follow up if this uh, affects their assessment of the likely court outcome. And you can ask them what might reasonably persuade the other side to change their assessment. Now, sometimes the parties have such partisan views that they can't even imagine what the other side's perspectives are. But if lawyers and mediators are skilled and, and reflect the fact that there may be legitimate perspectives on the other side and that, they, that their clients may actually have some ambivalence, you may be able to elicit this from your clients and um, help them understand that there may be some weaknesses or risks in going to court. And then this last point about what might realistically persuade the other side to change their assessment is an important one because that they're well, and they may know what it is that would trigger them to change their assessment. So having a discussion about the other side is a very helpful technique that lawyers or mediators may be reluctant to do because they're afraid that it will trigger um, recriminations, um, but it, it can be a very helpful technique. Another helpful technique is to ask the clients how it's affected them so far. It can be a good indirect way of learning their interests. Generally, they will complain. Very few parties say, I love being in litigation. Just give me more of it. I want to spend more time and money in this process that makes no sense to me. Um, Sometimes they actually will appreciate it because they understand the litigation process or they want to inflict pain on the other sides. They don't really enjoy it. And it provides to an opportunity having this conversation with them, reflect on how they might um, be able to stop hitting their head against the wall uh, because it feels so good when they stop. Okay, intangible costs. You can discuss intangible costs in many different ways, such as by asking. For example, you could say earlier, you said that relationships were important to you. How would going to trial affect your relationships or how would going to trial affect the stress you feel, your medical situation? You could coach them. You could say, well, when I see people late in litigation, they often say that it's taken a toll on them. So you're giving some asking you're delegating, you're saying, please discuss this with your lawyer or your spouse or your supervisor or your colleagues uh, about how going to trial may affect you. Or you could tell them, um, going to trial is likely to hurt your reputation and keep you from doing the things you want to do. So there are numbers of ways, different ways that you as a lawyer or mediator can um, help clients think about the intangible costs. And then we'll discuss how much they've spent so far, how much they expect to spend in the future if they go to trial. And they may not have exact figures, round numbers are fine. And then in the discussion are the trial risks, the BATNA, the expected court outcome. As I said, lawyers have a difficult challenge to assess the likelihood and consequences of numerous uh, contingencies in litigation 
and then combine them all into an overall assessment. It's extremely hard to predict what's going to happen in court. And lawyers use a variety of processes to perhaps the most common is reflecting on their past research and just an intuition about what's likely to occur. A lot of times lawyers will consult with others, for example, supervisors or colleagues that they know, other lawyers. Uh, there's a process called using a decision tree where you identify all the major uncertainties or contingencies and then assign the probabilities of the outcomes of these contingencies and what the, the outcomes would be. And then in a mathematical process, you combine them to produce a single expected court, uh, expected outcome. Um, it, it can be a very complex process and there's software that is used, uh, can be used to uh, construct these decision trees. Um, people really have very different. Some people really find the decision trees very helpful in identifying all these contingencies and then combining them into a, a single mathematical um, uh, conclusion, and then also using it to consider uh, possible variations at changing their assumptions. Um, on the other hand, some people are very wary about using decision trees. Um, they feel that it requires a lot of assumptions that they aren't confident about and that it produces um, a result that they, again, aren't confident about because of all the assumptions that are being combined. This book that I've co-authored described at the very end uh, provides a very simplified framework for using this decision tree logic which is yet a, another way of, of making a, an ass, uh, assessment of what the trial risks would be. Um, because so uncertain, uh, clients often find lawyers' assessments vague and confusing. Uh, sometimes the lawyers will some say, say something like winning. Uh, what does good chance of winning mean? 51%, 75%? Some clients will hear that as saying 95%. Um, or sometimes client lawyers will go in the other direction. They might write a very detailed letter, which will identify lots of different specific contingencies and make it very hard for the clients to, uh, to figure out what's really likely to happen. And so to help clients understand, make their best understanding about what is likely to happen if they go to trial and so that they can therefore have good decision making. It requires good communication between the lawyers and the clients. And again, that's, that's hard, but it's important and it can produce real benefits for the clients in terms of feeling good about the process and then making the best decisions they can. Mediators can help in assessing the likely Generally, we recommend doing this after asking the clients about their interests and the intangible costs. Parties may be confident that they can persuade the court about certain factual, legal, or remedies issues, and then less certain about others. So you might discuss issues where they might lose, ask them about that. And then you can discuss possible rebuttals to the other side's arguments, and then discuss realistic probability that the court would file in their favor on those issues. So basically, this is a process to help them do a very careful, rational analysis about what would happen if they went. So mediators can discuss the trial risks again in various ways. You can ask what's your sense of the probability that you can improve just which are duty at trial. You can coach them and trial. Many judges would have questions about that issue. You can delegate this. Please discuss this with your lawyer about the likelihood that you'd be able to approve exit trial, or you can tell them. I think that most judges would decide why about issue X. Now you can ask how you can be helpful. And this is true for both lawyers and mediators. Don't assume that the parties just want to, you to agree with them or take the most extreme partisan position. They may want a process and outcome that feels fair, which you should not underestimate parties may really want that. They may want your candid assessment of the situation. They may want your understanding of the other side's views, advice, and a negotiation strategy. 
and help in persuading the other side. So a variety of different things that clients may want. And the bottom line is you shouldn't ask, you shouldn't assume what they want. You should ask what it is that you can do that would be helpful or what they're looking for. Now, mediators differ about whether they will give their opinions to parties. Some mediators give opinions at the outset, sometimes without the party's permission, and this is problematic. In my view, and most mediators view probably that that's, well, mediators shouldn't do that. Opinions, mediators should ask the parties if they want your opinion about any particular issues. And parties are more likely to accept mediators' opinions if you first understand the case and they ask for your opinion. So instead of giving it right from the beginning, mediators, good mediators who do give their opinions often wait until they've had quite a bit of discussion with all the parties so that they understand the situation and the party's perspectives. And at that point, the parties are more likely to feel that the mediators understand the situation and then they may be willing to ask for the mediator's opinion. They may not want the mediator's opinions and mediators should respect their wishes. Mediators essentially act as dispute system designers for individual cases. When I talked about dispute system design before, I was talking about a process for a whole series of cases. Here I'm talking about mediators as designing a process. And in fact, they do this already. They orchestrate the preparation for mediation and the exchange of information. And of course, with the pandemic, uh, mediation has been almost exclusively by video. And that, that creates an opportunity to design and manage the process. And the Lyra process provides more and better tools for designing the process in consultation with the lawyers and their parties. Uh, planning for optimal decision making in terms of timing, accommodating their and, and procedures in making the, the, the mediation work well, accommodating the party's process needs, timing and sequence of sessions. You may break it into multiple sessions, as I'll talk about, and also particular individuals. One of the things that Historically, where mediation was assumed to be done in person is that where there are parties that are or large organizations, often the key decision makers are senior officials who don't have the time and aren't willing to attend a mediation. That's very frustrating for everyone. One of the things that one can do with Lyra and with video is to arrange for the, the key decision makers to attend for particular times without having to go through the entire mediation process. So what can you do to promote a good dispute? You can develop realistic theories of change, which I'll talk about shortly, promote good relationships of lawyers with clients and counterpart lawyers, promote effective early case assessment processes, use dispute system design processes to change disputing cultures. So really what this is about is, is about dispute resolution practice in one's can, not just in a particular case. Now this is a long, difficult, slow process. And so to the extent that you want to improve dispute resolution in your community, your practice community, you need to be patient and persevere because it is a long and slow process. Now, this theory of change that I mentioned is a process for producing social includes the following steps, identifying the long-term goals, identifying elements needed to achieve the goals, identifying a some conflict context, which is really important because a lot of a lot of people make it that they are unconscious of and the assumptions may not be accurate. I think they may be biased. Identify potential interventions to create the desired change. And then importantly, one should develop indicators so that you can measure the outcomes and know if you're actually producing the change that you're 
you're trying to pretend it's helpful to write a narrative explaining the logic behind the initiative. Again, this is very helpful for making all these assumptions more explicit and having people test them out. All right, this slide has links to lots of blog posts and articles that provide more details about all the material that I've just described. And here is information about this book about Lyra, which I co-authored with Michaela Keat and Heather Haven. And here's a link where you can find out more about the book. And if you're interested, you can order it. And for more information, you can check out my website, my two, the blogs that I write on, and then um, you can email me here. So I hope you have found this to be helpful. And uh, if you'd like, I invite you to get in touch with me. I hope you found this valuable. Take care.